Truman uh, Book Club, and this is our third book that we're reading. And I have started recording, so we will post this. I've had a lot of people request that this be um, recorded and then posted. Uh, we're going to put it, I think, on YouTube. And so if you, um, you know, are you might want to be careful about what you say if you don't want to, um, I don't know, just be mindful that it is being recorded so you can speak as freely as you want or not at all. Um, so let's welcome our guest. His name is Steve Scheinkin. And this is the book that we are reading this month. And the reason there are several reasons we chose this book. Uh, one of them, obviously, the Oppenheimer movie, and this is related. So we thought a lot of people would be interested in that. And I also wanted to get young readers involved. Um, the books that we have chosen in the previous months were technically for adults, but I really wanted to engage young readers and for us to read with them and for us to also embrace young liter young adult literature because I know that's something that I just started, young adults, I just started reading in the last couple of years. And at first I felt kind of silly because I thought, oh, this stuff is for kids, it's for teenagers. But they're so, I, I just love young adult literature. It's just very engaging. Um, it's fun to read. And so far I haven't found a book that was dumbed down. And so this is one of the books that I didn't feel like, like the author was, um, it was he was just writing it for any audience. Um, so anyway, I'd like to introduce Steve. If you could please uh, say a little bit about you, about yourself and about the book. Yeah, thank you for that nice intro. How's my audio coming through for everybody? I'm sure. seeing, uh, I, yeah, I I'm fine. I'm trying to decide if I want to mute myself. Okay, either oh. way, it's up to you. No, no, it could be, and I want it to be more of a conversation, but. That's, that's good to hear. I'm a big believer, of course, I would say that in young adult literature, but I, but, but you're right. I don't try to write for any specific age. I just want to write books that are really compelling <clears throat> that are also accessible to young readers. I think a lot of adults read them too, but the idea is that you don't have to know anything going in. Say if you're in middle school, you don't know about the, the science, the politics of World War II, making of the atomic bomb, that's fine. And for me, it all goes back to uh, textbooks. I hate. I, I, I talk mostly in school. I'm us, I usually um, give presentations in middle schools, and and I have to confess to them that I used to work on history textbooks for years, which they they resent, of course, because they don't usually like their textbooks in there. They're really boring. I don't know if you remember your history text. Maybe you like them. I don't know, but. The problem with them really is that there's just no room to tell stories. There's no room to get into characters and moral dilemmas and, and scenes and the things that make books or movies great. And so I did that for years and I kind of collected lots of stories and thinking, well, I, I, I want to be a writer, but maybe I can use this stuff in a more interesting way. And that's what led me into this field of taking nonfiction, true stories and telling them uh, still true stories, it totally is nonfiction, but in a narrative, hopefully page turning way. And I don't know, does it make sense for me to share some some pictures when I when I talk a little bit about the book? I'll, I'll try that and see if it's easy for everyone to see it. Let me try that. Let me just go to um Not seeming to let me show the screen that I want to show, but let me try this. Let me try one more thing, and if it doesn't work, it's fine because all right. So I can't see you anymore. Can you see the the uh, PowerPoint screen? Yes, we can see it's it. A, okay. You see all yes. the slides, Steve. Right. I'm going to go from the beginning, and now you're seeing covers, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, good. All right, I'll be back in a second, but this helps a little bit to show. I know you guys know this story a lot more than the typical audience I talk to, but it'll give a little bit of an insight into how I came up with this story and, and how it sort of evolved into the book that it became. 
And this is a good place to start. I'd just love to jump around from World War II to the Cold War, to civil rights, to sports, to the American Revolution and everything in between. And I'm happy to talk about any of these books. Um, but I'll start, okay, I'll start with, where does this idea come from of doing this book about the making of the atomic bomb for, for this age group? And I, it wasn't something I necessarily set out to do. My books always sort of come out of a, a process of just kind of finding one interesting thing and then following, following the leads. And I don't know, this is going way back. Does anyone remember seeing this article? Or maybe you know this story, George Koval. This is from Smithsonian, this atomic spy. And this is what got me going on this subject. I was just kind of looking at ideas for books. And he's fascinating. He was born in the US to parents who were immigrants from the Soviet Union and kind of really committed communists, even though he grew up in Iowa. You know, be doing American things, going to high school, playing baseball, and his family moved back, his parents moved back to the Soviet Union when he was a teenager. And the Soviet intelligence agencies loved him. When they met him, they just thought, wow, we can't, you can't train a kid in Moscow to play baseball and speak with a Midwestern accent. It's just, this guy's just perfect. So we're gonna take him and train him to be a spy. And so it has all the setup of a great spy story. When he was really young, trained as a spy, sent back to the US, Record keeping wasn't all that great back then. No one in the US even knew he had ever left, let alone been trained you know, in, as an intelligent agent. See the guy smiling on the, um, I don't know if you can see my little arrow, but this guy over here, that's George, who's just oh, yes. in the US Army. He's, I guess he's smiling because <laughs> no one has any idea what he's up to. And we know very little about the story. That's That's kind of an important caveat. He, we know he listed the army. We know he was sent to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, which was really important in the Manhattan Project, and, and had some scientific knowledge. And so kind of a perfect place to be a spy. This is where we were enriching uranium to make what we hoped would be the first atomic bomb. And so all that works really well, but it kind of hit a dead end there. There's not that much known about him. He disappeared after the war, and there was an FBI investigation. I this was the first time I did this. I used the Freedom of Information Act to get his FBI files. And it was, I mean, thousands of pages, just like this, of, of investigators going out and interviewing people who had known him. So what do you think this guy was up to? And nobody really knew. He was good at his job. He took some information, but we don't know what, and then disappeared. And so I had I sold this idea for a book to my publisher because it just seemed so compelling, this young spy in the Manhattan Project. And then I started to panic because even after I got this FBI report, I really didn't have a story. I just didn't know. I couldn't get very close to him at all. And and I talked to some Cold War and, and atomic espionage experts, and they said, you have to talk to this guy who wrote about Leslie Groves, who we'll talk about too, and the Manhattan Project. And I and I asked him almost in a in a panic because I was such so new to this writing, and I didn't know what happens when you go to your publisher and tell them you can't do a book that you promised to do. And he told me something very wise. He said, oh yeah, this, this Koval story, that's really great. Somebody should definitely do it. There's just, there are just two problems with the story. And I know exactly what he said, I wrote them down. He said, we don't know what he did and we don't know if it was important. <laughs> and that's after I sold the idea to my mom. So can you, I mean, can you picture that on the back of a book? We don't know what he did, but it was important. So I, then I was really worried and then, but then, even in the same breath, almost the same sentence, he said, but did you ever look at this fellow Ted Hall? And Ted Hall is another atomic spy who's also not really famous, but this is this was the light bulb moment for me. And I hadn't heard of him, as most people haven't, maybe some of you have, but this is Ted Hall, Theodore Hall, and this is his ID badge, since you know, and they were. this is one thing the movie was very authentic about, the ID badges in Los Alamos. This is Theodore Hall's ID badge in Los Alamos. And he looks really young, I, I bet to all of you guys. Sometimes when I show it in middle school, they say, no, he looks older than us. But he, he barely was, he was 18. And he was recruited right out of Harvard where he had already had an undergraduate degree at 18 in physics. So that gives you an idea of the level of intellect. Recruited directly out of, out of Harvard into Los Alamos. And all on his own, not to give too much of a spoiler if you don't know his story, he became a spy. He, he, 
even as a teenager, he just, he had, well, we can go into his reasons. He had his reasons or thought he did and decided to give plans, bomb plans to the Soviets. And I thought, wow, a teenage scientist spy, that's my story. And I started digging into that story and it, it, did, it did become a big part of bomb, but, but he didn't enter the war. He wasn't recruited rather into Los Alamos until 1944. So that's pretty late in the day in terms of the World War II story. And I realized in order to tell this, especially to uh, a younger audience that didn't have the background knowledge, I needed to step back and give, give a bigger picture. So he kind of became a subplot in the story. And I start instead with the science of splitting uranium atoms, the discovery of fission that was made in Germany. It was made in Hitler's Germany right as or right before Hitler started World War II. And scientists realized right away in this very, very small world of theoretical physics, that is, that if you could split a uranium, the nucleus of a uranium atom, and it would release this tiny amount of energy, enough to make a grain of sand jump two inches or so, then if you had a lump of it, they didn't know how much, and you could get a fast chain reaction going where those atoms would, one would split two, would split four, and it would go in a fraction of a second. That would be essentially a bomb. It would be a massive explosion. And just doing the math, they, they calculated roughly what it could do. It could blow up a city. And in this very, very small world of theoretical physicists, this was a very interesting idea. Nobody goes into that field to make weapons, but it was just a very interesting idea that happened right as Hitler started World War II. And some of the scientists, including Lisa Meitner, this brilliant young physicist, were Jewish and, of course, fled or were fired from jobs in Germany and beyond as Hitler expanded his power in Europe. And the idea made its way very quickly to across Europe and to the United States. And that's where we meet Robert Oppenheimer. This guy just has to be the main character of the story, not just because of that awesome hair he has as a young man, but, <laughs> but uh, there's a reason there's a movie. Of, I mean, I'm surprised it took that long to, to make a movie about him. And you could make 10 more. That's part of what I'd love to talk about later, the things you think there should have been in the movie that were left out. But he was just fascinating from day one and full of energy and, and, and complexities and contradictions. But as a kid, he was just, he was brilliant. And, and, and like, a, I, I liken it to a superpower that he had that he didn't know how to control. Like when the superhero first gets their suit and they don't know how it works. So he would go into school and just brag about how smart he was. Apparently he would go into junior high and say, hey, hey, fellas. Ask me a question in Latin and I'll answer you in ancient Greek. And of course that led to him being being punched in the head, unfortunately. But <laughs> I'll make uh, it real popular, yeah. Yeah, I mean his parents didn't get it. I mean, of course they realized, okay, this this kid's special, but they said, We gotta toughen up young Robert. We're gonna send him to a sports summer camp, which is just the you know, the worst thing you could do. Oh, but God. it's uh, it's character development. It's actually really useful, especially when telling the story to, to to a younger audience. Hey, this guy was was your age, and here's how he was when he was your age. And they could relate to some aspects of it and, and the difficulty of that. And he grew out of that, thankfully, and became a physics professor, which was what he was always destined to be. And this is his kind of superhero outfit. This is how he looked in the movie, always smoking, which was realistic. I mean, the guy would go through packs a day. And they said he as he was writing this math and science on the blackboard, he would his head would just disappear into a cloud eventually because he swiped so rapidly that you would see his hand writing on the board and he would just be in a cloud. And you just had to follow along as best you could to, to what he was doing. And so this is where we get to meet him in, in my book. And it's before World War II. And I was looking for a story to sort of it's that classic show, don't tell, you know, let me see what this character is like. And I was really hoping they would use this story in the Oppenheimer movie. Some of you may know it. And this is from his, his days at, at Berkeley when he was a young professor. And there, were even, there was even an article that made its way into the newspaper, embarrassingly enough. So the story very, very briefly is that he went out, out on a date with this woman named Melba Phillips, who was a fellow scientist at Berkeley. And they went up to this romantic spot above the Golden Gate Bridge, a beautiful place. You could park the car and and have some privacy. And so it should have been a great romantic moment. But Robert turned to her at some point and said, uh, do you mind if I get out of the car and think about science? 
which I don't I don't think you should probably do on a date, but he was being himself and, and he could only ever be himself, that's for sure. And she understood that. So he got out and started walking and getting lost in his head and whatever physics question he was pondering and ended up walking all the way home from this mountain to campus and then realizing he was kind of tired and just decided to go to bed. And by that point, he had actually forgotten he was on a date. And this is how it wound up in the newspaper because Melba fell asleep. He was gone so long then woke up in the middle of the night and flagged down a police officer who helped her search for his body, thinking they might find him in the woods. And, and then they eventually searched his apartment and found him at home in the middle of the night. And somehow a police reporter got, got their hands on the story. And, and that's just a wonderful little two minute scene. I don't see how you could resist using that. But again, with Oppenheimer, more material than you could ever use. But you get this idea, okay, this guy is a brilliant physicist who can't remember he's on a date. And you really feel like, okay, I, I kind of know this guy now. Is he the right person to, to lead the Manhattan Project, to save the world from Hitler? Uh, maybe not, you know, that's, uh, that's debatable, but it's interesting. And here he is with Leslie Groves, the army general who chose him to lead this secret lab. And they picked this spot Again, I hope you can see my, well, you know where Los Alamos is. It's um, right here in New Mexico. And it, there was nothing there, not literally nothing. There was a school there. It was the top of a mesa. And they just wanted someplace very, very secret where they could start work right away. Oppenheimer's job would be to recruit scientists to the secret lab. But they also, they didn't have a day to lose. As far as we knew, the Americans knew and the Brits knew, the Germans were ahead of us because they had discovered fission. And maybe they were ahead of us in terms of making a bomb. And so there wasn't a day to lose. They wanted some place where they already had buildings and plumbing and electricity. And they stumbled upon this spot. Robert Oppenheimer knew the, knew the area. He loved New Mexico, even though he's from New York City, but he loved coming out west. And there was a boys' school, a ranch school on top of a mountain where kids played hockey and shorts, which is awesome. And they just said, this is perfect. This is our, this is our secret lab. Just uh, send all the kids home. You know, of course, we're not going to tell them why they have to be picked up, but just kick all the kids out of school and put up some gates and fences, and that'll be our our secret lab. And that's that's exactly what happened. And I won't tell you the whole plot of the book, but there's really three strands. Once I get the balls kind of rolling, I wanted to focus on the science, of course, of the making of the, the bomb and the American effort to race toward building a bomb, not knowing if they were ahead or not. And then two other things, the spies, who tried to steal the, the secrets of the weapon. And they were mainly Soviets or inspired by working with the Soviet Union. And of course, you remember there, those Soviets were our allies in World War II. We were helping them literally survive the German invasion. But at the same time, we didn't consider them our friends and didn't expect to be friends with them if we were both left standing at the end of the war. And so we're not planning on sharing these secrets with the Soviets. They were aware of that and resented it naturally and pulled off what, um, you know, we have to admit is probably the greatest bit of espionage in world history. They got not one, but two physicists inside Los Alamos. And Theodore Hall was indeed one of them. And this woman in this picture, Lana Cohen, was her go, his go-between. She was the courier who was sent out west to pick up bomb plans. So that's a great kind of thrillery, cloak and dagger, change of pace from the science elements of the story. And then a third element, which a lot of people have said is their favorite is this action sequence of commandos who went behind enemy lines to sabotage the German bomb project. And they were Norwegians. This story is really famous in Norway, or if you have relatives from Norway, they'll know all about it. It's not real famous in the United States, it should be. But when Hitler took over Norway in 1940, a lot of these young Norwegians were desperate to fight back. Their country had surrendered. And they made their way to Britain and were trained as commandos, secret agents, go behind enemy lines, blow stuff up. They didn't know what they were being trained for, but they were willing to do just about anything. And they were taken in this really dramatic scene to London and, and given this assignment of going back to Nazi-occupied Norway. They were going to parachute in with cross-country skis, which they had grown up on, and, and explosives. And they had these assignments which were directed at blowing up labs and equipment that Germans were using in their atomic bomb research. And it feels just like a, an Indiana Jones movie, but real and just so high stakes, action shooting, 
adventures. It's just it, for, from a writing standpoint, and hopefully a reading one too, it's just a great complement to the science scenes, the spy scenes, and then you jump into this action scene. And this is a story that I didn't know anything about when I started writing the book and got really, really into and wrote way more of this than I was able to use. So I'm happy to talk about some of those stories too. And it all comes together, of course, with the testing of that first atomic bomb, which was a big part of the movie. And they got, of course, they got what the bomb looked like pretty much right. It really does look like a prop, but not from a hundred million dollar movie, right? It looks like a prop from a B movie, really. But this was really it. And there really was a guy who sat with it right up until they started the countdown. They just wanted to kind of make sure that none of the wires fell out or anything like that. And uh, of course, everyone got well away before it was before it was exploded and tested. And the word reached Harry Truman when he was in Potsdam, Germany, meeting about the end of the war. And he still didn't think the Soviets knew about it. In fact, he, they, they actually did. And when he told them, when he told Stalin about it, he was he didn't understand why Stalin didn't really react to it. And of course, didn't know at the time that the Soviets already knew about this bomb. So that's kind of the shape of the story. And this is the last thing I'll show for now is just uh, how I set up my office and putting up cards and using different different color cards for the different storylines. It helps me organize a story like this so I can jump from a science scene to a spy scene to a commando scene back to a, a scene in the White House and the scene in Moscow and things like that. And that really helps me mix and match and arrange a storyboard. It, it's, it's called the story. It's something you would learn in a, in a screenwriting class, but I find it really effective for for this kind of planning, planning out a kind of thriller style of a story. So I'll stop sharing my, my slides for now. And I'm just, yeah, so that's the, the essential story of the book and the making of it. And I would be happy to answer questions, ask questions. Let me just get rid of this and open the discussion. I don't know how you find that it works best. Azalea, what do you, what do you think? Sure. Typically, the author just asks an open-ended okay. question. What did What did you think about it? What was most surprising? What was your favorite part of the book? Just very simple questions. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to assume that that everyone has read it or has read it already. But if anyone has, I'd love to. Well, let's talk about. Let's start with Oppenheimer because he's so much in the news. Uh, I the, just find uh, it endlessly fascinating. What do you? I'd love to hear what you think about. Steve, I, I saw the um, the movie a couple of a weeks ago, and first of all, I was kind of disappointed that I saw it in IMAX because it was like you don't get anything more with IMAX. I don't, they made such a big deal about IMAX, hmm. but I wish they had had you as a consultant on the on the uh, movie because the way that you described. Um, fission in the book i mean and i've read about it before of course like most people and you know try to understand okay what was it how that but the way that you explained it in there was so much more you know understandable and i think if they had taken like the way that you explained it and maybe made some graphics you know some some sort of you know computer generated graphics that would be you know, more engaging, they, it would have been a, a lot better, you know, you would have kind of grabbed onto the idea of what it was about a lot more. But that was one of my favorite parts of the book, actually, which I never thought it would be, uh, just simply explaining what that whole thing was. And, and especially the, the discovery process, when they, you know, the first time that they were, they, 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 found out about fission and, and wait a minute how this happened and then they had to go back and figure out what well, no what that's that might, that means that you know something else and, and they understood it that way and then the whole thing about um uh neil's board you know saying no that's impossible and then realizing no that's the case and it, it that was just really uh, uh i thought the technical explanation you know, was was spot on. And uh, I really like, I think that in general, the book for me was just, it was so clear. And I think that's one of the, the advantages from maybe, and I, I'd be curious and maybe later on to 
hear your take on, you know, because on YA literature, because the thing that it does for me is that it, it cuts to the chase. Mm -hmm. It seems like too much these days for a, when they, they, a book is published for the, I guess the adult market. So, uh, so to speak, the more, the more pages you put in it, the, the more, uh, you know, the better it's going to be. And we both know that that's not the case. You know, it's the old thing about, uh, it's much harder to write a short essay than a longer essay. It's always easier. It's kind of like, you know, you're, 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 you're writing your high school uh, uh, 5,000 word essay and you know, it's, you can just put in more words and more words and more words, but that doesn't make it better or clearer or communicate anything uh, better. And uh, I, I found that the clarity that I got from this book on all the different strands of the story was really excellent. And I, I, I kind of like to hear your your take on YA literature. I mean, is this something that you, I, I think you said you didn't really plan getting into it. This is just how fell it. Was it from the publishers? Uh, how did that, how did that happen for you? In terms of my entry into it? Yeah. Or my approach to it? Yeah, it, it really, it happened through the textbook world in the sense that I was writing for this audience already. But I felt I was writing badly for them because I wasn't telling them the stories that I would have been interested in when I was their age. And it was oversimplified and it, it, it just wasn't compelling. It's just not what textbooks do. So that was the challenge. And, and, and I totally agree with you about, about the kind of, it, it, it can be more difficult maybe to write a shorter, to tell the story in, in fewer pages, but it, it, I do, I prefer as a reader, I prefer that. And, and what I notice when I read nonfiction, I read, a, a, you know, of course, lots and lots of nonfiction for research, but also for fun. But sometimes with adult books, they just put in everything they found because they found it and it is interesting, <laughs> but it's not, it's not a good read. <laughs> it's not, it's not compelling to this. They didn't make those hard cuts or their editor didn't, didn't show them enough tough love, maybe. Or maybe they felt their ego didn't allow for them to hear that when they when they did hear it. And, and so I think that's really essential to make those really hard choices, to cut scenes that you really love. I wrote a whole scene, not, I mean, a whole chapter, at least one, about those Norwegians. They, they pulled off this incredible sabotage operation, parachuted into Norway, found their way on skis, up and down down and up this gorge to this heavy water factory this is where they were making this substance that, that the germans needed for their bomb research and to make a nuclear reactor uh, and blew it up and this is essential it's a really important part of world war ii history and and then i wrote a whole chapter about the, how they got away it was called the getaway and it was how they got away how do you get away with ten thousand nazis chasing you because that's what was going to happen the, the, i mean the Brits told them, the Brits were really great at planning these secret operations, the SOE stuff, going in, you know, undercover and all over Europe. But they told these guys, you have about a 50-50 chance to get in. And in terms of getting out, I mean, good luck. You're not doing this, you know, so you can live a long life. And uh, and they all got away. And and it's just a remarkable how they did it. And And so I had a whole chapter about that that my editor said, and this wouldn't happen in an adult book, maybe, but she said, "You, this is off topic. This isn't what the book is about. I know that's heartbreaking, but we should cut this whole entire chapter because they've already done what they set out to do. They've blown up the factory. They've set back German research six months. Now you need to cut back to see what Oppenheimer's doing. You need to cut back to see what the spies are doing. And she was right. It took me a while to admit it. But if you if you happen to have the paperback of um, there is and this is great this wasn't my plan but uh, of course I kept the chapter and it's back here yeah there's a there's a chapter in the back called the getaway it's just a deleted scene just like you would have in a movie or a TV show I don't know if any of you guys if you see that if you ever like to watch those deleted scenes in yes I really enjoyed reading that oh, I you thought read it was it. a okay, very yes. interesting chapter yes. 
Yes, I liked I liked the book a lot. I read it before I saw the movie. Okay, good. And um, actually, there's the graphic novel out. Yeah, yeah. There's oh, I just happened to have it right here. This is brand new, actually. This oh, just came cool. out, and so it's my it's that. sort of my version of the movie that I would make because well, graphic novel was, is so much like it. Like when I was looking for the book at the library. Um, on my um, iPad, the only thing they had was a um, example from the graphic novel. So I got that and read that and thought that was the book, was the graphic novel. And then I realized, no, it wasn't. So I had to order it from the paperback from Amazon and got it. But I enjoyed it immensely because um, just like Paul had said, the way you described the atomic bomb and how it was put together was very clear, much more so than like Richard Rhodes' book, The Making of the Atomic Bomb, that was kind of like the book to read about it. But um, it was a more, much more confusing <laughs> in yeah, reading was, about it. Much more detail. Yeah, absolutely. Much, that much is, more detail. Bible. But I enjoyed it so much. I enjoyed reading the the way that you you took in the Norwegians and what what happened there, what happened in um, when Stalin you know found out how far we were with the bomb, and what happened in Tokyo when there was the conflict of do we unconditionally surrender or do we not unconditionally surrender, and and then what happened in Truman's office. I loved the way you give little snippets of what happened throughout the world. Um, I was just fascinated by the book. I wish they had done as good a job in, you know, that short scene in your book with Truman. And I wish they had done that good a job in the movie because the way they portrayed it in the movie was just like, I don't know, <laughs> it was cartoonish. It was, that's it was. exactly the word I would have used, cartoonish. That's that, And there were a lot of good things about the movie, I thought, but... I thought that was a weak, a weak point, and and since we are talking, it to to the you know through. The Truman Library, we should talk about him too, and and and. He he's a really interesting part of the story, but again, he only came in in that one, very kind of one dimensional way in the in the movie. But, as as a lot of you probably know, he, he was the one as a senator who said, what are we spending all this money on? <laughs> Nobody was really that curious or digging that deep, but he was a, you know, he was a stickler for not wasting money, made him a good public servant. And he said, $2 billion, what? And we're building secret cities? What, what's that? Right. <laughs> and he, he tried to send his, his staff to go find out about it. And at a very, very high level, you know, they had to tell him, listen, you don't need to know about that. And it's just so funny. It's one of those twists. You couldn't even make it up for a, a novel because it would be too much. It would just feel like you're trying too hard that he then becomes the president who has to decide what to do with it. Steve, it's interesting that you mentioned that because we're going to, uh, Azalea is bringing in uh, Steve Drummond, who wrote The Watchdog, which is a oh, really overlooked, it's, you know, about Truman. They, they mention uh -huh. it. But that was basically what set him up to be vice president. And of course, if he that didn't happen, he wouldn't have been president. Right. Was being a, a, a you know head of that Truman. Well, they tr called it a Truman Committee. I forget the the actual long uh, name of that. But uh, he was all about cutting costs and and saving money. And the thing about it was, he was worried about you know they're going to build all this equipment for the run up to the war, and then they're going to send it out to the GIs. And the stuff isn't going to work and you know soldiers are going to die because of shoddy stuff and he really saved not only millions upon millions of dollars but also saved probably a lot of soldiers and sailors lives because you know he found out that you know these companies were making junk yeah. you know yeah that's an important point All right, well i mean I'm, I'm happy to ask other questions or if anyone wants to jump in on what we've been talking about so far feel free steve i i wanted to ask um 
when I, I have a daughter who uh, is just started fifth grade. And so we go to the bookstore and I try to get her to read nonfiction. We go to the bookstore, there will be 50 yards of young adult fiction. And then there will be a, a shelf about this wide that has a young adult nonfiction. Why is that? Why isn't there more? That's been the question of my career, basically. <laughs> it's, You're right. It's frustrating. And I like to think we're making progress. I mean, there's definitely more good stuff, good nonfiction for middle school. Publishers call it middle grade, but it's basically what your, your daughter's age and, and up through sixth, seventh grade and, and young adult than there ever was before. But it's still, I unfortunately refer to it as a health food aisle. It's still its own little section mm. that's not this big, bright, colorful thing that attracts you in. And studies have shown, and this is the message that it just hasn't gotten out enough to publishers, that at least half of kids want to read nonfiction when given the chance, when given the, the choice. You can't just assume everybody wants to read about a kid going to magic school. It's not true. But that's the, kind of the assumption that, that is made and, and and it affects a lot of things. So I, yeah, it helps to, you have to keep getting that word out. But I mean, my part in it is hopefully just to make books that are that can win kids over when they give them a chance. And so that's, that's what I focus on and try not to focus too much on when I go into a store, right. you know, why, why haven't that up this way? But I've noticed that <laughs> certainly all over the country. Yeah, good. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm I glad you're, you're doing it because uh, we need more. Yeah, and if, you look, so, if you're looking at aisle and buying stuff, I mean, that's, of course, that's the only thing that would really make a difference in the long run. Right, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, um, happy to hear more. I want to I want to talk a little more about the spies too, because it was spies that, that got me into this. It's my love of spy novels, whether it's James Bond, John le Carré, old British spy novels. And, and when I realized I could do something like that with this book, that's what really sealed it for me. And again, I, like I said, I started with Theodore Hall, who's such an interesting character, little known. And then kind of found my way into some of these other atomic spies. Some of them were scientists, some were committed communists, some were just there because twist of fate and things that happened. I start the book with with uh, Harry Gold, who was one of the spies who just never should have been, never should have been a spy, and was not ideologically committed to to the cause at all. But got involved helping helping a friend who was a communist before the war. Got the guy got him a job, and he was just really grateful and sort of the sort of the kind of person who was easy to push around. And the guy recruited him in and and, and got him a job. And then said, "Hey, since you're at that job, maybe you can get me some of the the papers, the plans that they're they're using to make their chemicals." And it seemed innocent enough to him. And one thing led to another. And next thing you know, he's got a handler from you know what precursor of the KGB and meeting him in parks and lying to his parents. He was living with his mom and dad. I mean, you know, you shouldn't be a spy if you're still still living at home. <laughs> if you're not ready for that world. He had to lie to them about having a girlfriend and, you know, so he could go do his spy stuff. I mean, it's really interesting that he became the courier to Klaus Fuchs, who was briefly in Again, too briefly for me, easy for me to say in the movie, because I think the spy, they really didn't focus on the spy stuff uh, very much, but he was he eventually became a really important player in the story because he went out to Los Alamos to pick up plans from Paus Jukes and brought them back across the country. And so I start the book with him. I start the book in a, in a prologue with, in 1950, after the war, where he's trying to destroy evidence. He's been this hapless spy for 17 years and he just wants to get out. But now the FBI has found their way to him and they're coming to his, his house. We still have, lives with his dad, Philadelphia. And he's trying to destroy stuff. He's throwing stuff in the toilet. He doesn't know what to do. And the FBI knock on the door and that just makes it, to me, a really good opening to, the, to a spy story and lets you know. I had an editor at the time who was great 
and I worked with her on a bunch of books, and she would always say, like, you know, what is this story really about? And this one is sort of about a lot of things, but I wanted to give it that spy thriller feel, even if kids aren't used to reading those kind of books. And and so that that kind of I tried out a bunch of opening scenes and landed on that one. Partly because it gave me that feel. It really felt like a a 1940s movie to me. And, mm -hmm. and that kind of allowed me to lead into the, the kind of story and the atmosphere that I wanted. Steve, I wanted to talk about that. So I typically read more of classic literature with um, Jane Austen, you know, Moby mm -hmm. Dick, Little Women. And so when I read, I sort of brace myself for, you know, hours of reading. And then you finally get the good part and then you sort of have to read for a long time. Um, but with this book, I read this out loud with my son, who's 10. Hmm. I don't know why I'm holding the book, because you know what book I read. <laughs> I felt the need to tell you what book I was reading. Um, but um, I, we took turns reading it out loud. And um, yeah, that's one of the things. It sort of like sparked something in my brain, you know, the spy stories. Um, it just it was just really fascinating to read something that was more fast paced and just sort of kind of got your adrenaline going. Um, so I just want to say I really enjoyed that. Thank you. That's really good to hear and that, and that you shared it with with a 10 year old. It's very, very cool, too. You I wonder know, if anyone Steve, had other, um, or if someone was about to ask something. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was um, going to ask. I you mentioned something that really was interesting to me when you said that you kind of did a storyboard like a screenplay because instead of going to see Oppenheimer, I read the screenplay or I read Nolan's screenplay. So, you know, it was interesting to kind of read that and visualize and then and also read Bomb, which I had read years before um, in library school. And also see that you both based a lot of your story um, stories on American Prometheus. And it was fascinating to me to have such different takes. And one thing I don't know, have you read the, has, I don't know if anybody's read the screenplay on, on the call, but mm -hmm. just one thing that was fascinating to me about that is it is written, unlike any other screenplay I've ever read, it's, re it's written in first person for Oppenheimer. So instead of a scene saying Oppenheimer is sitting quietly, it says, I'm sitting quietly. And so that was something to get used to. And so you can tell that it's, you know, it's very, it's, it's, it's focused in a way that's different, which is fascinating based on the same information. Yeah, I agree. And I would actually really like to see that screenplay because the, it was just so ambitiously edited and the way, the way it was presented, I wonder if it, if it changed a lot from, from the written page to the, to the film and then to the editing room. That'd be really interesting to see. But yeah, you're right. It's the perspectives on him. I mean, and on Oppenheimer, I just think he's argue he's definitely one of the most fascinating figures in American history. I mean, I, I, that's subjective, I guess. But but I've actually said I, I think it's kind of fun to think about like, okay, suppose William Shakespeare could write a historical play about about an American. You know, who would he pick? And I guess you'd say Abraham Lincoln, but I think you could make a good case for Oppenheimer, the, the, the richness and complexity that that American Prometheus kind of angle to it, that the, he was the father of the bomb. What was it like to, to do that, to live with it? He once said, I need physics more than friends, which is not a, maybe not a great way to live, but he was being honest about himself and he used this thing that he loved, his greatest love maybe, to to make this terrible weapon and he he had his reasons for doing it and while he was doing it was very focused on winning that race but then immediately realized at, at, at the end of the war he's the father of the bomb and what does that mean and and the movie really focused on that i thought they really focused on what that did to him and meant to him and and how he adjusted to and lived with that which is which is really endlessly endlessly fascinating there are a lot of, I mean, this this is one of those books where I wrote a lot of a lot of stuff that I couldn't use, not just about the Norwegians. I'm wondering if anyone had other favorite stories or or people who were in it who 
who they really liked or wished there had been more of or anything like that. Well, one quick thing I'd like to add, which was very different. The depiction of Kitty Oppenheimer was so different in both stories. I, I think Kitty had, um, she was a very pivotal figure, but she was portrayed so differently um, in your book versus Nolan's film. Yeah, she was a really and, a main character in the film, which I, which was not true for me. Yeah, that's true. Exactly. And I think also, too, um, some of the things with women that um, were depicted in the film almost detracted from the story, whereas your story focusing on various spies enhanced the story. Well, that's good. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting to hear. Yeah, one of the, one of my, again, you could say a favorite character without loving the actual person or what they did. You know, like I love, I, one of the mm -hmm. most the favorite person to write about in all of American history is probably Benedict Arnold. Now I'm not saying I'm, a, I'm not <laughs> saying I want to hang out with him, but uh, just. Hey, Steve, I had a question about that. I know it's kind of a little no. bit off topic. Did, did you get into that because, uh, I mean, I saw that you live in Saratoga Springs. Is that because of the Battle of Saratoga? No, that was even before I lived. I, I was living in New York City then and just I was just fascinated by Arnold. And, 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 and I just love these big, contradictory, larger-than-life characters. So that's really how I got into them. And I do live near where the Battle of Saratoga take, took place now. But I was, I was going to talk about Lana Cohen, who is, one of, who is one of my favorite characters. And she went on to have a really long career as a Soviet spy. She was actually a, a librarian in New York City who just was a committed communist in her, in her secret life. And her husband was, too, and got recruited into doing this courier work for the Soviets. And, and I wrote a companion book to Bomb called Fallout, which takes place during the Cold War and especially the, the early 60s up to the Cuban Missile Crisis. And she's in that too, because she continued her job. She, she disappeared during the 50s when we started to, to get really suspicious about communist spies in America disappeared and, and showed up again in, in England, London, under, with a whole new name and a whole new, she was now a Canadian, this kind of absent-minded Canadian housewife and, and started a whole second career as a spy and helped again steal plans from a, from a British base during the Cold War. And so, yeah, she was one of the women who, who I just, I, I, some of the characters I, I loved so much, I wanted to put in more and just had to, to restrict it to the parts that were really important, hopefully, that were really important to the story. And she was really important because she was the one who went out to, to meet Ted Hall. And it was really helpful to the, to the Russians that they got two sets of plans from two different spies that were the same. And because that when they, they were, you know how, paranoid true Stalin was and, and anyone working for him thinks wow if I give this guy the wrong stuff the wrong material disinformation uh, you know that's the end for me and so the fact that they were able to get two independently two different sets of plans for making that bomb the very bomb that we saw in that test scene that plutonium bomb and they were basic scientifically the same and so that was really essential to the story too. Hey, Steve, one thing I did, I did want to ask real quick, uh, there's a scene with Philip Morrison when he's bringing the plutonium sphere out to Trinity. Yeah. And it's just in a suitcase sitting in a, next to him in the back of the car. I mean, that, that kind of blew my mind. It was like, I don't think that would happen today that they would be, be so, sitting that close to a sphere of plutonium. So much of it wouldn't. I mean, it was all done, yeah, by the seat of their pants a little bit. I mean, they were spending a lot of money, but you're right. And and, and there were there were lots of those kind of details that weren't in the movie that could have could have made great scenes. I understand you can't use everything, but that the um, one of the guys who was a, a, an expert on explosives and this, these explosive lenses they made. Does he x-rayed them right before the test and found there were holes in them. Right, yeah. And uh, 
he cho he took on the job because he said, no, I'm not going to ask anybody else to do this. I'm going to get a dental drill, and I'm going to drill into this plastic explosive and fill in the holes with, with liquid that will harden. And and Oppenheimer said, uh, it doesn't sound like a very good idea. And the guy, George Kistia Kowski, his name was. He said, well, if 50 pounds of explosives go off in my lap, I'll never know. <laughs> and that was it. And, and, and those were, that was, it wouldn't have worked if he hadn't done that. Because everything had to be, and I wish the movie had, had explained this because I feel like they could have explained this without getting into a lot of math. Yeah. This idea of implosion, they had all this uranium, but it wouldn't work for, it would only work for a certain kind of, a really simple type of bomb and they had a lot more plutonium but that wouldn't work for this this what they called the gun assembly just shooting two pieces together and so they needed to invent this idea of implosion and they came up with a really good analogy it's like trying to blow in a full beer can on itself without spilling any liquid now figure that out mathematically how to do that without a computer that's what they did and so they had to build these lenses that were incredibly complicated and electronics that were obviously synced up within millions of seconds to accomplish that implosion, to blow this plutonium in on itself. It's just incredibly, inc whenever you think of the bomb, I mean, it's just an incredible achievement that they pulled this off. Yeah, like you said, without, you know, just making stuff up as they went along. Obviously not computers to use, but also just, putting stuff in the back of the car, using dental drills, whatever they had to do. And when they put, it's a comic moment, but when they when they put that core of, they had that tent set up outside in, in New Mexico, and when they put the core of plutonium into the bomb, or tried to, it didn't fit the first time. It, was, it had just expanded in the heat of the tent, and they realized you know, that they needed to, to let it cool off. But just so little little tiny things like that. That, that are just fascinating to me. And I fit a lot of them in the book. I didn't fit a lot of them in the book. There's so much, there's always so much more to find out. All right. Yeah, but what you was in there was really interesting. Oh, that's good to hear, thank you. Yes, it really was. Okay, we're gonna wrap up the meeting and, um, and then I wanna announce next month's book. So Steve, do you have any final words? No, I'm just really, I'm really happy to to do this. I got a new book coming out tomorrow. If anyone's interested, it's it's called Impossible Escape, and it's another World War II story, but very different. It's about a teenager who escapes from Auschwitz, the Nazi camp in Poland, and it's just, it's the most remarkable true escape story that I've ever come across in my life of research. And it's the story of how he did it, and and the report that he made to the world about what he had seen there. And so that one's been many years in the making and it'll be out in the world this week. Okay. We'll look for it. We'll have to bring it into the store. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Really Thank you. So I wanted to talk, um, Tim, you accidentally spoiled it. I'm oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so we have uh, Steve Drummond coming next um, month to the Truman Library. He'll be speaking in person. And um, Steve Drummond is an NPR journalist. He also teaches at the, he teaches journalism at the University of Maryland. So we're very excited to have him um, next month. And I've started reading a little bit about it and it's about the Truman Community. So it's really fascinating. And I am going to send somebody a copy of this book. I don't have a signed one yet because he is not, um, so he he hasn't shown up yet so but um i put you guys' names those of you that are mm -hmm. that joined so i put your name in here and i'm going to pick one person wendy i didn't put your name on there since you won last time <laughs> that's right <laughs> very good <laughs> uh evan evan are you still here let me see, A, B, C, D, E, yeah. All right, so if you wanna just send me your, I, well, I actually, I have your email, I think, whenever you're registered for the book club. So um, 
but I just have your email, so I'll need your address so um, we can send you the, a copy of the watchdog. <laughs>